Hello and welcome to this video and uh, this video is going to be called the Big Jazz Rock Fusion Quiz with the subtitle um, So You Think You Know About Jazz Rock or something like that maybe um, How Much Do You Know About Jazz Rock because that first title was a bit like um, sounded a bit like uh, aggressive didn't it so the way this works is I'm going to ask you 20 questions you need to get a pen and paper write down the answers and then I'll go through the answers and you can see how much you know. Now I did one of these last week on progressive rock and it was really really hard. I was a little bit insecure that if I did something that was too easy everyone would go oh Andy's quiz was too easy and all that type of stuff so I made it really hard. This one's slightly easier I think um, but it's still pretty hard so don't don't be uh, upset if you don't get that many because there's some difficult questions here this is just for fun I hope you enjoy it so um, if you've got a pen and paper handy um, then I will go through the 20 questions which I have down to my right hand side here and I will be reading them out and then I'll go through the answers and hopefully even if you don't do uh, that well on this quiz um, I hope there'll be some interesting facts along the way that you will find um, compelling. Right, so should we start off? I'm going to start with question one. And this is a relatively easy one just to get us off the ground. So if you don't know the answer to this, you might uh, find this quiz a little bit difficult. So question one is, what is the name of John McLaughlin's debut album that was released in 1969? So I'll repeat that again. Question one, what is the name of John McLaughlin's debut album that was released in 1969? Write it down. Don't worry about spelling. Right, question two. Who is the electric guitarist who appears on paraphernalia on the Miles Davis album, Miles in the Sky? Electric guitarist played on Miles Davis. Who would that be? Mm. I'll repeat that one again. Who is the electric guitarist that appears on the track Paraphernalia on the Miles Davis album, which I think came out in 1968? The Miles Davis album, Miles in the Sky. Mm. Tricky, tricky. Right. Question three. Who was the original drummer on the Return to Forever album, Hymn to the Seventh? Galaxy, right? That album was originally recorded with another drummer, and then Chick Corea, in his infinite wisdom, decided to re-record it with another drummer. So, who was the original drummer on Chick Corea's "Hymn to the Seventh Galaxy"? Mm. A jazz rock legend. Question four. All right, they're going to start getting hard now. <laughs> Question four, which Mahavishnu orchestra tune was sampled on Massive Attack's huge hit, Unfinished Sympathy? Which was the Mahavishnu orchestra tune which was sampled on Massive Attack's huge hit, Unfinished Sympathy? Making a certain member of that band quite wealthy in the process. That was question four. Question five, which legendary music producer produced Apocalypse by the Mahavishnu Orchestra and um, Blow by Blow and Wired by Jeff Beck, a legendary producer? So I'll repeat that question five again. Which famous producer produced Apocalypse by the Mahavishnu Orchestra and Blow by Blow and Wired by Jeff Beck? Okay. Question six, the tune... Where the Moon Goes by Weather Report features which vocal group? The tune Where the Wind Blows. No, not Where the Wind Blows. Where the Moon Goes. Shall I just do this again? Because you might have got confused. <laughs> Who did Where the Wind Blows? That's anyway the wind blows. That's Frank Zappa, isn't it? I've got confused. That's making it worse for you. So I'm going to do this one again. Because um, I think I did that wrong. Question six. Right, the tune Where the Moon Goes by Weather Report, Where the Moon Goes by Weather Report, um, off the album Procession, recorded in 1983, features which vocal group? Write it down. I, I've been told, who's texting me now? As soon as I start filming, I get a billion texts coming through. Um, I got told that people were enjoying this face. 
the the um, the the face that is there to provide a bit of space for you to write the answers in. So I I I'll try and remember to keep that up for you. You know any bits of crass entertainment I will throw at you on these videos that I do. So what have we got at number seven? Question seven. Um, which jazz fusion musician produced and co-wrote "How Will I Know" by Whitney Houston? Mm. That'd be another very rich man, wouldn't it? Mm. There's no money in jazz rock, you see. I'll repeat that one again. Which jazz fusion musician produced and co-wrote "How Will I Know" by Whitney Houston? I think that was her debut single that made her famous. Right. Question eight has got two answers, or at least two answers. There might be another album that I don't know of, but there's two answers. If you get one of the answers, you'll get half a point. Right. Um, so, question eight. Name the two Larry Coriel albums that feature John McLaughlin. The two. Oh, I know the one. What, 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 is, there, is there another one? Yes, there's another one. There's two. I need the, both of them. Come on, jazz rock aficionados. You need to know this stuff, don't you? If you need to know this stuff, you're going to watch my channel. I shouldn't say that. I'll lose viewers. Right. Question nine. The Alphonse Muson album, Mind Transplant, features which rock guitarist? Now, there's three guitarists on that album. I will accept any of those guitarists. If you could name all three, you will get a bonus point. But I'm just after one of the guitarists of that and a specific one, which rock guitarist. So I'll repeat that again. You know, the album um, by Alphonse Moose on Mind Transplant features which rock guitarist? That was question nine. Question number ten. Alan Holdsworth played guitar on the John Luc Ponty album Enigmatic Ocean alongside which other guitarist? There's another guitarist on there and he plays incredible. You know, it's an incredible preparing of two guitarists on that album. Something quite rare for Alan Holdsworth. So who is the other guitarist alongside Alan Holdsworth on the Jean Luc Ponty album Enigmatic Ocean? Question 11. Which bass player made their major label recording debut on the Aldi and Miola album, Land of the Midnight Sun. Which bass player made their major label recording debut on Aldi Miola's Land of the Midnight Sun? Now, if that's not true, that is according to Aldi Miola. So don't blame me, right? But I thought it was an interesting fact. Right, question 12. Jean-Luc Ponty, El Shanker, and Don Sugar Kane Harris played violin for which artist? So which artist has utilised the violin skills of Jean Luc Ponty, El Shanker, and Don Sugar Kane Harris? Right, that was question 12. Question 13. Who plays keyboards on the Jeff Beck's track Thelonious off Blow by Blow? And they also wrote that tune. So which keyboardist is the keyboard it's on Thelonious off by off blow by blow which is now by Jeff Beck. Right, question 13. Oh we've just done question 13, we're on question 14, right? Question 14. What is the name of the only studio cut on the album Heavy Metal Bebop by the Brecker Brothers? Right? The rest of the album's live, it's recorded live, but there's one track that was done in the studio and it was the single off that album. What is the name of that track? Great track. Right, um, number 15, right? And you've got to get two answers on this. If you only get one, you get half a point. So, question 15. Who are the two guitarists on Chick Corea's Electric Band's debut album? There's two guitarists on there. I need to know who they are. So who are the two guitarists on Jeff Beck's... Uh, not Jeff Beck. Um, this is rubbish, isn't it? I'm confusing you. On Chick Corea's Electric Band's debut album. Oh. The other one went much better than this. Anyway, we, we're still there, right? So anyway, um, question 16. Name the late great drummer that plays on Gino Benelli's Brother to Brother, Imaginary Voyage by John Luc Ponty, and A, 
by the progressive rock band Jethro Tull. This guy is a monster drummer and I feel that he has been forgotten in the mists of time because he died relatively young. So who is the name of that great drummer? Gives me an excuse to mention him on the channel. Right. Question 17. A bit easier now. Um, what was the name of Ornette Colburn's jazz funk group that worked from the late 70s through the 1980s? All right, so what was the name of Ornette Coleman's jazz funk group? It's question 17. Question 18, right, is who played sax on the Material tune? Material was the band which, which was put together by Bill Laswell, recorded a number, album, a number of albums starting from the late 70s onwards. And there's an album called One Down, and on there there's a track called Memories, and it features a very young Whitney Houston. Yes, the second Whitney Houston bass question in my quiz. Who was a saxophone player on that tune? Right, question 19. We're nearly there now. Um, which jazz, rock, jazz fusion legend plays the saxophone solo on James Taylor's version of How Sweet It Is To Be Loved By You? An absolute jazz fusion legend who's that saxophone player and if you he's got he's got so i've given you a clue it's a man um he's got such a signature sound that if you just sing that saxophone solo in your head you will know who it is if you know this guy right and now we're into the last question of in my big jazz rock quiz um who was the other performer alongside stanley clark on his tune if this bass could talk which is off his album if this bass was could talk. So who's the other performer on that tune? So there's my 20 questions, right? So I'm gonna run them through again, just in case you missed one and you want me to go back. So question one, what is the name of John McGoffin's debut album released in 1969? Question two, who is the electric guitarist um, who appears on Paraphernalia by Miles da on the Miles Davis album, Miles in the Sky? Um, number three, who was the original drummer on Hymn to the Tenth Galaxy by Return for to Forever? Uh, Question four, which Mahavishnu Orchestra tune was sampled on Massive Attack's huge hit, Unfinished Sympathy? Question five, which famous producer produced Apocalypse by the Mahavishnu Orchestra and Wired and Blow by Blow by Jeff Beck? Question six, the tune Where the Moon Goes by Weather Report on the album Procession features which vocal group? Question seven, which jazz fusion musician produced and co-wrote How Will I Know by Whitney Houston? Question eight, Name two Larry Coryell albums that feature John McLaughlin on guitar. Question nine. Alphonse Musner album Mind Trump Transplant features which rock guitar player? There's three guitarists. If you get all three, you get a bonus point or something. But you got anyway. Um, where are we? Yes. Question ten. Alan Holes would play guitar on John Ponty's album um, Enigmatic to Ocean alongside which other guitar player? Right, so question 11, which bass player made their major label, label recording debut on Land of the Midnight Sun by Aldi Miola? Question 12, John Ponty, El Shanker and Don Sugar, Chain, Sean Don Sugar Kane Harris played on which, um, with which artist? I can't get my words out today. That's one of the skills you need to be a YouTuber, is to be able to get your words out. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Um, it's probably because I'm in a different room. I need my records behind me. There's an energy source that comes off those and it fuels my ability to speak. And I've noticed when I come here, I, you know, I'm not as funny. I've noticed that. And uh, uh, and I, I can't get my words out. But I'm trying my best. I'm trying my best. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Right. Um, question 13. Who plays keyboards on Jeff Beck's Thelonious off Blow by Blow? Um, question 14. What's the name of the only studio cut on Heavy Metal Bebop by the Brecker Brothers? Um, question 15, who are the two guitarists on Chick Corea's Electric Band's debut album? Um, question 16, which late great drummer played on Brother to Brother by Gino Vanelli, Imaginary Voice by Jean-Luc Ponty and A by Jethro Tull? Question 17, what was the name of Ornette Combs' jazz funk group Primetime? Question 18, who played sax on the material tune Memories, which also fe featured a very young Whitney Houston on vocals? And question 19, which jazz fusion legend plays sax on James Taylor's cover of How Sweet It Is? And question 20, who is the other performer 
on If This Bass Could Talk by Stanley Clark. Right, so we have the 20 questions. You've got your answers there locked down. We're going to go through the answers now and then um, you can put your score in the comments and we can see who is the king of jazz rock and jazz fusion knowledge amongst my viewers, of which there should be very many very knowledgeable listeners and music fans out there. So let's go through it again. So question one, what is the name of John McLaughlin's debut album released in 1969? And it is, of course, Extrapolation. Or no, which is his only album that he recorded in the UK before moving over to America. And I think it features um, John Sermon on saxophone. I think it's Brian Hodges on bass. And then it was the great drummer, great free jazz, jazz drummer, Tony Oxley, who died quite recently. You know, it's an incredible album, one of the great British jazz albums. And really one of these sort of... Um, um, early jazz rock albums and it really is truly a jazz rock album so that's what we got for question one is extrapolation question two who is the electric guitarist who appears on paraphernalia on the miles davis album miles in the sky recorded in 1968 and the answer is george benson now i placed it there hoping that some of you would get fooled into writing john mclaughlin even though that album, Extrapolation, is recorded in 1969 and he couldn't be in America recording that album in 1968, could he? No, it's George Benson. We have to give George Benson the credit for being the first electric guitarist uh, who played with on a Miles Davis album. And Paraphernalia of Miles in the Sky is a very, very early jazz rock um, fusion tune. So, question three. Who was the original drummer that played on Hymn to the Seventh Galaxy by Return to Forever? And the answer was Steve Gadd. Um, Steve Gadd was the first drummer of choice. If you follow um, Chick Corea's catalogue, you can see that Steve Gadd is featured on many recordings by Chick Corea. Obviously a favourite drummer of Chick Corea. But um, he did not want to join um, the band Return to Forever. He didn't want to go out on tour. He was doing too many lucrative sessions, I think. And so um, Chick didn't want to go out with um, a drummer, a different drummer to what was on the album. He wanted to have a band. So he then re-recorded the album with the drummer Lenny White, who is a drummer that appears very young. He was like 18 years old. He appears on Bitches Brew alongside Jack DeJohnett and Don Elias, these incredible drummers. And that is where the contact between Chick and Lenny White must have been made, was at that point in time. Lenny White brings a, a much more propulsive, you know, fiery sound. And it would be interesting to hear the um, the Steve Gadd version of Return to Forever. Now, um, there must be a recording of this, and I have searched to try and find it. And I'm sure there's one out there. And I'm sure many years ago I heard it. But recently I've tried to go back to try and find a recording of it, and I just can't find it. So if anyone can give me a clue, is there anywhere where we can have a listen to the Steve Gadd version of Return to Forever? Right, so, um, question four. Which Marvishna orchestra tune was sampled on Massive Attack's huge hit, Unfinished Sympathy? Right, so, the answer is Planetary Citizen, which is a track of Inner Worlds. On that track, um, Ralph Armstrong brings in this very funky tune with a sort of incredible um, vocal yell. And he goes, hey, 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 hey. And right at the beginning. And that it really forms the chorus of Unfinished Sympathy. Massive Attack sampled it without permission. One night, Ralph Armstrong sat in bed watching TV and a BMW advert comes on and it's got Unfinished Sympathy on it. I think it was BMW. And uh, he thinks, hang on, I know that vocal. That's me, that is. And then he challenged them and he got a very healthy payout as so he should uh, for that record because it's that's the hook on the chorus so uh, good on you Ralph I wish that would happen to me which which is a big pop band had sampled me doing something anyway uh, question um, five which famous producer produced Apocalypse by the Mavish Yorkshire Wired and Blow Bye Bye by Jeff Beck and it's cause the legendary George Martin producer of the Beatles and if you watch the George Martin documentary he, when he's listening to um, that album Apocalypse by the Mavish Nostra and it gets to the track Smile of the Beyond with that incredible vocal by Gail Moran 
he bursts out to tears and said, this is one of the greatest things I ever produced. Quite incredible. Right. Question six. The tune Where the Moon Goes by Weather Report off the album Procession features which vocal group? A pretty easy one, I thought. It's, Ma it's the Manhattan Transfer. Um, when I was a young kid, my mum and dad bought a, a Manhattan Transfer album called um, Extensions. And this album blew me away. It fe featured a whole ton of jazz fusion musicians on it. It was all different stuff on there. It was quite commercial. But I'd never really heard anything like that, especially the drumming and the smoothness of the playing. And of course, the vocals were incredible. And that al album opens up with a version of Birdland by Weather Report. That was the first version I heard. And when I heard the the actual Birdland by Weather Report, I was a bit let down because I'd got used to the, the Manhattan transfer version. Um, Apparently, Joe Zawinul was very impressed with that, so he invited the group on to this incredible epic track that's on procession called Where the Moon Goes. Now, that album does not get the credit. Um, it's absolutely incredible. And Where the Moon Grows just builds and builds, and it utilises the Manhattan transfer in a way you wouldn't expect. Um, on the album Extensions, there's quite robotic sounds, and Zawinul goes down that line. Incredible track. Go and check it out. Um, question seven, which jazz fusion musician produced and co-wrote How Will I Know by Whitney Houston? It is, of course, my favourite drummer, the greatest drummer in history, Narada Michael Walden, and a friend of this channel. And Narada is such an incredibly talented musician and has gone on to have an illustrious, illustrious produce, production career, producer the likes of Aretha Franklin, Whitney Houston and Mariah Carey. And in all those three singers' case, making them what they were. I mean, Aretha had been a legend before, but Aretha's career was flagging in the 1980s. Narada comes along and writes a couple of hit records for, you know, like um, Who's Zooming Who and stuff like this. Um, and, uh, of course, he produced the debut album of some of the greatest singers, Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston. So Narada, what a legend, what a guy, you know. Not only the greatest drummer in the world, but one of the greatest producer in the world. One of the great musicians and a great artist. He's had hit records in his own right. Shall we move on? Get away from the Narada worship. Right, so, question eight. Name the two Larry Curry albums, Curry L albums that feature John McLaughlin. Well, of course, the first is Spaces. But the second, which I think came out in 1974, was Planet End. Now, Planet End actually brings together outtakes from Spaces and also outtakes off their debut album by The Eleventh House, introducing The Eleventh House. And it's great. And I prefer the tracks on that, that album to the tracks that they originally put on the original albums. I don't know whether it was mixed, but I don't know what it is. Or maybe I'm, I expected too much, I think, from Spaces when I heard it. Anyway, um, so you get um, a point if you mention Spaces and Planet End. If you only put Spaces down, you get half a point. Sorry, I am tough, right? Question nine. The Alphonse Muson album Mind Transplant features which rock guitar player? Well, the rock guitarist in question is Tommy Bolin, who also played guitar on Spectrum for Billy Cobham. And I really felt Mind Transplant was Alphonse Muson's attempt to sort of copy the success of Spectrum. Um, that's probably a bit mean really many people think it's a jazz rock classic for me it's a little bit derivative um, it also features the guitarist Lee Rittner and Jay Graydon and if you put Jay Graydon or Lee Rittner down well done because they're the ones that are never mentioned and uh, you get a point for that um, but if you mentioned all three you can have two points alright question 10 Alan Holdsworth played guitar on the album Enigmatic Ocean by Jean-Luc Ponty and he shared the guitar with um, which guitarist and the answer is Daryl Stumer. Daryl Stumer ends up as the sort of live guitarist for Genesis. Uh, Daryl Stumer is a, is a sort of classic jazz rock alternate picking guitar player. Holdsworth of course is the king of legato. There's two completely different sounds and on that album they actually duel with each other and it's very interesting to hear. Most guitarists would have been walked all over by Alan Holdsworth, but not Daryl Stumer. He is great on it, and he's, he, he really comes up with some great, interesting guitar playing. And I think it's the context of having the two different styles that work so much. For a guitarist, it's a classic album. And for many Holdsworth fans, it's their favourite album. So um, I was glad to be able to mention that in this quiz. Right, question 11. Which bass player made the, their major label recording debut on Land of the Midnight Sun by Aldi Mola, which was also Aldi Mola's debut album. 
and it is on the track Golden Dawn, which is virtually the whole of side one or the great chunk of side one, and it is of course the bass legend Jaco Pastorius. And that features Jaco Pastorius on bass, Aldi Miola on guitar, it's it's probably Barry Miles on keyboards, and Alphonse Muson on drums. What a band! Alphonse Aldi and Jaco all on the same track. It's an incredible track. One of my favourite moments by Aldi Miola. Because it's so funky. Jacko is funky on that album. Right, question 12. Which um, artist did the violinists Jean-Luc Ponty, El Shanker and Don Sugarcane Harris play for? Now, I was hoping the less knowledgeable people would have heard El Shanker and Jean-Luc Ponty go, well, it's got to be John McLaughlin, but it's not. It's Frank Zappa. Frank Zappa was responsible to really pushing Jean-Luc Ponty to the fore and actually made a Jean-Luc Ponty album which features Frank Zappa compositions called King Kong and he also plays violin on um, uh, on the um, Hot Rats um, sessions alongside the blues violinist Don Sugarcane Harris. Uh, Hot Rats is a very violin heavy album and also a pioneering jazz rock album and I have often wondered with that album coming out in 1970, whether that influenced the choice of John McLaughlin to get Jerry Goodman in on um, the in the Mavish Nuxtron in the Mountain Flame, and it's interesting because his first choice was John McLaughlin. So where uh, was uh, John McPonty? So where did John hear John McPonty? It's highly likely on the Frank Zappa album Hot Rats or King Kong. Um, King Kong I, features George Duke on keyboards, who goes on to play for uh, Frank Zappa and also plays for Miles Davis and if you watch the 1991 Seville concert also plays with John McLaughlin the the only keyboard player that I could think of that has played with all three of my heroes John Zappa and Miles right so um, question 13 is who plays keyboards on Jeff Beck's Thelonious off by Blow by Blow? It is Stevie Wonder, and he wrote the tune as well. And he wrote the Jeff Beck classic, Cause We Ended as Lovers. They were working on sessions together. Um, Jeff Beck was the guy that was on the drums playing that drum beat that inspired Stevie Wonder to um, write Superstition. This is bonkers, and so this is why they shared credits and uh, for, obviously for contractual reasons Stevie Wonder couldn't be put down on the credits so it's a very little known fact that Stevie Wonder actually plays keyboards or clavinets on Thelonious shall we move on um, question 14 what is the name of the only studio cut on the album Heavy Metal Bebop by the Brecker Brothers the Brecker Brothers Heavy Metal Bebop is my favourite album by the Brecker Brothers and it's made all the more glorious and fiery because of Terry Bozio's incredible drumming on the live stuff. But it opens up with a sort of funky song with vocals. Now for me, this is always where the Brecker Brothers lose me, especially when Randy Brecker starts singing. When Randy Brecker starts singing in the Brecker Brothers, it's so bad, I don't know whether it's actually good. I, 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 I always... I never skip the tracks. I enjoy how awful they are. And I've, I, I, I recently covered an album that Randy Brecker made, which is all his songwriting, which is some concept album about him being a taxi driver and watching himself go on and have it, having these very sex, sex capades, as they used to say in the 70s in the year of Britain, um, usually around, you know, films like Confessions of a Window Cleaner. Um, and uh, so... I'm never too sure about the vocal stuff that, that um, the Brecker Brothers do, but this one I love. It's an absolute classic. It's got sort of gang vocal. You feel like the whole band singing along, and I don't mind that. Anyway, so it's East River Drive. Question 15. Who are the two guitarists um, on the debut album by Chick Corea's Electric Band? It is, of course, Scott Henderson and Carlos Rios. Now, for some reason, I was under the impression that Carlos Rios was dead and I am still convinced he's dead now as I'm saying this but I don't think he is dead he might be still alive I actually don't know I'm very confused on this subject is Carlos Rios alive or dead now I think what's happened is I got him confused with Carlos Vega who was an incredible drummer 
who is dead. He committed suicide. And I think the name Carlos has made me think that Carlos Rios is also dead. But this hasn't happened with Carlos Santana. I, I know that Carlos Santana is still alive. But now as I say it, I doubt myself and I start to think, well, maybe Carlos Santana's dead as well. I'm very confused about this, but I'm pretty sure Carlos Rios is alive. Anyone who's watched the videos where I've gone to the, the late, great Carlos Rios, I apologise. And I apologise most profusely to Carlos Rios, because if he saw this, he must have been very confused. But I hope I have now managed to use this quiz to clear up that and explain that I have a, a blind spot when it comes to Carlos Rios. Um, my head is saying he's still alive, but my heart is saying he's dead. The mystery of Carlos Rios. If he dies now, and I have to do a video on him, saying the great, you know, jazz rock fusion guitarist, and he's great, he's an incredible guitar player, Carlos Rios has now died, I'm going to, it's going to look terrible. So, shall I move on? Question 16, the late, great, now this bloke is dead. The late, great drummer who played on three incredible albums, Brother to Brother by Gino Vanelli, um, Imaginary Voyage by Jean-Luc Ponty, and, surprisingly, A by Jethro Tull. It is the drummer, the late great drummer, Mark Craney, one of my favourite drummers. Now, everybody goes on about Asia by Steely Dan. Oh, isn't it wonderful? It's got its incredible drum solo by Steve Gadd. And it is incredible, right? But my Asia is Brother to Brother by Gino Vanelli. Now, Gino Vanelli is sort of the Tom, the, the Italian Tom Jones of jazz rock. Um, back in the early 70s, you could see him bestriding his incredible jazz rock fusion band, you know, up there on stage, dressed in white with his huge hairy manly chest bursting out of his shirt and hair that could be seen from space, right? And a voice that just soars and incredible. And this guy is, is, is just the perfect fusion of smolts and jazz rock. Brother to Brother is a 10 minute epic and on there, that it does everything. It does. It's funky. It's groovy. It's got incredible solos. There's an incredible guitar solo. And I hate to think who the guitarist is on Brother to Brother because I got a horrible feeling that it's Carlos Rios. And maybe that was why I thought he was dead because Mark Craney, who drums on this, is dead. The poor guy had kidney problems and he died. Someone said yesterday in the comments, they said, I'm starting to think that your channel, Andy, is fundamentally about death. And I think that's the case. That is the great esoteric heart of my channel, is the black chaos of death, right? But moving away from that, brother to brother is mind-blowing. And Mark Craney does a drum solo that is absolutely incredible. What everybody says about Asia by Steely Dan, which is a sort of pop song, which should just go so far out with that Wayne Shorter solo. So is brother to brother. Why doesn't brother to brother get the, the respect and legendary status, it's mind-blowing. When, when I was teaching Kidderminster College, I used to bring the students in, they're all into their Nirvana and Radiohead and all their rubbish, and I used to sit them down and make them listen to Brother to Brother. A, because the virtuosity was so incredible, but B, because they had never, ever heard anything like that. Right. I'm going off on tangents here. I'll just, you just want to know the answers, don't you? Right, where were we? Um, so question 16, the answer was Mark Craney, the late, great Mark Craney, one of my favourite drummers. Right, question, um, that was question 16. Question 17, right? Um, who, what, where and why? And who or what? <laughs> oh... I thought, get this, do this quiz, Andy. Just get through it. Don't go off on a tangent. Just get through it. They just want to do the quiz. They don't want to hear your nonsense. What was the name of the jazz funk, jazz rock fusion band that Ornette Coleman had in the late 70s through the 80s up until he died? And it was, of course, the incredible prime time. A fusion band that, for me, is up there. We've returned to forever. It's up there with the Weather Report, Mavish Nuction. And then when we get to the 80s, who are the great 80s fusion bands? Tribal Tech, maybe. Chicory's Electric Band. And prime time. And prime time are out there. Right? Um, I interviewed prime time's drummer on this, Calvin Weston. Incredible. Go and check it out. Prime time. Question 18. Who played saxophone on the material tune Memories, which also features a very young Whitney Houston? And the answer, surprisingly, is the free jazz saxophone player Archie Shep. Archie Shep, Whitney Houston. 
Who'd have thought it? Not me. Well, I would have thought it because I know the answer. Right, question 19. Which jazz fusion legend plays saxophone on James Taylor cover of How Sweet It Is? And it is David Sanborn, king of the Fusac, Muzak, Fusac, you know, easy listening jazz realm. And one of the few fusac musicians that I really love. I love Voyeur. I love Voyeur. I know it sounds like lift music, but it's beautiful lift music. And, you know, Marcus Millen and Steve Gadd and Sanborn, they're just sound amazing. I can't help it. There, you know, I've got, I, you know, I, I can go there with the, the, the Fusac every now and then. So we come to the last question, a little bit of a quick trick question. Who is the other performer? Notice I use the word performer. Who is the other performer on Stanley Clark's tune, If This Bass Could Talk? And it is the tap dancer Gregory Hines. Yes, he basically taps and they recorded his tap and then, you know, uh, Stanley slaps. Now, um, I would have called the album George Taps and Stanley Slaps. A much better title than If This Bass Could Talk because a bass can't talk. And if Stanley Clark's bass could talk, what would it say? What would it say? What's it going to say? Hello, I'm Stanley Clark's bass. What's it? Has it been? Is it got some secret knowledge? Is it part of the Illuminati? Or was it just turn around and go, Stanley? This Scientology stuff is rubbish. So, Gregory Hines. Uh, there is another track. The album opens up with "If This Bass Would Talk," and then there's a track at the end, I can't remember the title that Gregory Hines is on. It could be called something like Slap and Tap. If it's not called Slap and Tap, again, Stanley Clark has made another error, of which he made many in the 1980s. But I think he's slung the old Scientology now, and he's sounding amazing. The last few albums he's done are mind-blowing, but he was, he was a bit off in the 80s, wasn't he, old Stanley? Right, so shall I run through those answers again? So question one, the answer was extrapolation. Question two, action was uh, George Benson. Three, Steve Gadd, giving it a tick. Um, four, Planetary Citizen. Five, George Martin. Six, Manhattan Transfer. Seven, Narada Michael Walden. Eight, Spaces and Planet N. You've got to get both to get a, a mark. If you only get one, you get half a mark. Alphonse Muzon's Mind Transplant featured which rock guitar player Tommy Bolin you get a mark for Tommy Bolin you get a mark for Jay Graydon you get a mark for Lee Rittner but you if you get all three you can assign yourself two marks um, no more than two marks right um, where are we um, number 10 Daryl Stumer number 11 Jaco Pastorius number 12 Frank Zappa number 13 Stevie Wonder number 14 East River Drive Number 15, Scott Henderson and Carlos Rios. So you've got to get both of them to get the point. You can have half a point if you've only got one. Um, number 16, Mark Craney. Number 17, Primetime. Number 18, Archie Shep. Number 19, David Sanborn. And number 20, Gregory Hines. And we now get to the end of my um, jazz rock, jazz fusion, big quicks. So how much did you get? What was your score? Now, when I did the prog quiz last year, last week, and I can't remember the guy's name, and I did say I would remember, but I can't, I'm sorry. Um, I kept, I looked through all the comments on Facebook and on um, on um, here, and the highest mark was 16 out of 20. Most people were averaging around about five. I think this one's a little bit easier, so I'm, I'm expecting, I'm expecting, you know, higher numbers from my YouTube viewers. And if I don't see those higher numbers, I am going to be upset. What? I'm filming a YouTube video at the moment. Stanley Clark, that was. Upset with my comments about him. He's annoyed. Because he didn't come up with slap and tap. He might have, actually. Shall we actually just check what that track's called? Let's let's have a look on the old internet. Because I can't remember what that one's called. So let's have a look on the old internet. It's called Basically Taps. And with the word bass, basically, it's got two S's. So it's Basically Taps. Bass and Taps. That's terrible. That's rubbish. I've come up with slap and taps off the top of my head. My God, Stanley. It I love Stanley Clark. He really is one of my favourite musicians. I love him. And he seems to have a sense of humour. 
but when he burst in then he looked very angry and so I need to now finish this video and I'm going to make Stanley a cup of tea and sit down and go look just let it go you know just let it go um, if I'd have been around then what, what album that was I was, I was 1985 that album came out wasn't it 85 I'm always testing my jazz knowledge. What year was this? It's a, it's a 1988 album, three years out. I, I don't even deserve to be doing this quiz. I could have sworn it was 1985. It's 1988. Oh, oh God. Can you imagine if one of the questions was, what year was if this bass could talk? And I went, yeah, oh, it's 1985. I'd be so cocky and I would have got it wrong. Well, but that's, that's not where my skills lie. My skills lie in naming jazz rock albums. And... Um, you know, Gregory Taps and Stanley Slaps is way better with the title track Slap and Taps. I'm just um, I'm just milking this joke now, aren't I? Yeah. So if you like this video, I haven't done such a silly one for what for a while, and and I actually before I started this video, I thought, have you lost your silly skills because your videos have been quite serious recently? Uh, and I thought maybe maybe I have. Um, but um, the silliness has now re-emerged on this video so I do apologise for that um, if you like this video please like it and I keep saying that it won't hurt you to like the video but it will help me right now if you want to help me help me if you don't want to help me don't help me but if you do want to help me then press like um, if you want to see some more you can uh, press sub sub subscribe can't you and then you'll hopefully see more of my videos which I want you to do and then, um, if you want to support me, you can go over to my Patreon. Uh, I've recently posted a video over the last couple of days um, about postmodernism because that's come up a lot. It's a bit of a garbled video, but I've tried my best. And I've also um, put up the new Patreon meeting. So I will be meeting online on Zoom with my patrons this Friday at 6 o'clock UK time. If you want to come and say hello, then all you've got to do is become a Patreon. You know, put a month's money in. You have to pay for it. I ain't going to do it for free. Right. And then uh, if you want to support me another way, um, then you can put some money in the tip jar. Okay. I'm done. That video is nearly three quarters of an hour long. My God, my videos are long. Everyone else, all these other YouTubers are doing 10 minute videos. My video is like an hour and a half long. And it's because I witter. All right. But uh, that's the way it is. I have to get through it my own way. We're done, I think. I'll see you on the next video. Bye.